we have an incredible roster of Trillium Book Award winners here today. And I just wanted to take a moment first to tell you a bit about them. I'm sure you know, but Trillium. First, Waisen Choi. Grew up in Vancouver. <laughs> he studied creative writing at the University of British Columbia. And after moving to Toronto, he taught at Humber College for over 30 years. The Jade Peony, Choi's first novel, won the Trillium Book Award the City of Vancouver Book Award, and was cited by the Literary Review of Canada as one of the 100 most important books in Canadian history. Wayson has also published an award-winning memoir, Paper Shadows, which was nominated for the Giller Prize, and most recently, Not Yet, a memoir of living and almost dying, which was selected as a best book by the Globe and Mail. I also want to note that Wayson received the Order of Canada in 2005. Jeff Latosik, right here, his first book of poetry is a, or his first book is a poetry collection entitled Tiny, Frantic, Stronger. And it was published in the spring 2010 by Insomniac Press. And it went on to win the Trillium Book Award. His work has been published in magazines and journals across the country. He is a recipient of the PK Page Founders Award and a finalist for the Bronwyn Wallace. Also, I'd like to add, he was an amazing online writer in residence at openbooktoronto.com uh, right before his big trillion win. Robin Maharaj, done at the end, immigrated to Canada and in 1993 completed a second MA at the University of New Brunswick. In 94, he moved to the town of Ajax, Ontario. <laughs> we have Ajax people? Love it. That's great. <laughs> where he taught high school for a number of years. In 98, Maharaj, along with three other Durham region writers, co-founded and co-edited the literary magazine Lichen, which was launched in May 99. Since then, he has, among other posts, been a writer in residence at the Toronto Reference Library, a mentor for young writers with Diaspora Dialogues, which is an amazing, amazing organization here in Toronto, and an instructor with both the Humber School for Writers and the University of Toronto School of Continuing Studies. He has published eight books, and most recent, The Amazing Absorbing Boy won the Trillium Book Award, and was named a Best of 2010 book by both Now Magazine and Uptown Magazine, was long listed for the 2011 OCM Bocas Prize for Caribbean Literature, and is a finalist for the Toronto Book Award, which will be announced on October 13th. Pasha Mala, in the Czech second from the end there has contributed to CBC Radio, Esquire, Nerve, Salon, and The Walrus and he writes frequently for the Globe and Mail and McSweeney's Internet Tendency. He is the author of All Our Grandfathers Are Ghosts, a collection of poems, and his first book of stories, The Withdrawal Method, published by House of Nancy, won the Trillium Book Award and the Donated Lead Literary Prize, was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Book Award, longlisted for the Giller Prize, and chosen as a Globe and Mail and National Post Book of the Year. His fiction has won the Arthur Ellis Award for Crime Writing and twice appeared in the Journey Prize Anthology. In 2006, is that right? He founded Now Hear This, a writers and school program based in Toronto. And Adam Saul, also in a check shirt right in the middle, is the author, <laughs> author of three books of poetry, including Jeremiah Ohio, a novel of poems which was shortlisted for Ontario's Trillium Award for Poetry, and Crowd of Sounds, which won the award in 2004. He teaches at Laurentian University's campus in Barrie, Ontario and lives in Toronto with his wife and three sons. Three boys. Do any of them want to be writers? Not yet. <laughs> Basketball players right now. Ah, perfect. Um, I'd just like to take a moment too for a call out to the Ontario Media Development Corporation, the OMDC. They worked with the Avroid on the Street to put together this panel. They administer the Trillium Book Award and they do amazing work promoting, developing, and supporting Ontario's cultural industry. So we're very lucky to have them. All right. So these winners of the Trillium Book Award have gathered here today to discuss and share their individual takes on the writing process in Ontario. Um, they're going to give us some tips on their favorite places to write, talk about their inspirations, and uh, also tips on things that have helped them connect and research while living here in Ontario. Um, as Jeff noted, I work with a project called Open Book Toronto and Open Book Ontario. And what we did was speak to all our, writer, our, our readers and ask them for questions that they wanted to give to this esteemed panel. So the event today is a mix of questions from readers, some of my questions as well, and at the end I'll open up 
the floor to any questions from the audience. All right, I know all of you must be readers because you're here at Word on the Street and that makes you some of my favorite people already. But are any of you writing as well? Excellent. Well, don't hesitate to jump in if you have comments or questions during the conversation as well as at the end. All right, over to you, gentlemen. Reader question is up first from John P. in Ottawa. To open, what is your favorite place or places in Ontario, and have you drawn these into your work? Why don't we start with you, Pasha? I know you were hiking this weekend. Is that one of your favorite yeah, places? Yeah, like, I, lo I, I like camping and canoeing and hiking. I was in Frontenac Park this weekend, and no, I don't draw it into my work at all. In fact, it's like the one thing that I do to get the hell away from my work. Um, yeah, I don't know, my favorite places in Ontario, I really like Yorkdale Mall a lot. I'm serious, it's like, um, it's one of the most relaxing places in the city. It's like very sterile and the light is like very, like refreshingly artificial and you just sort of walk through and let your brain turn to mush. Um, so yeah, I don't know, my stuff's not really that connected to place specifically anyway, so I like Ontario, but I don't think that I, you know, write that much about it. I'm also from London. And um, London has this great tradition of artists that get out of London. <laughs> so, and um, th that's not that's not entirely true. There's a lot of great artists who stayed in London, through, especially in the '80s. But uh, yeah, I, I kind of I haven't written about London, though. So that's where I spent you know most of my life. Perhaps I will one day. Adam. Yeah, I, I guess I'm the same. I'm, I tend to write about places when I leave them, um, and since I'm still here, uh, I haven't written that much. I mean, my last book was about Ohio, um, because I, and I started writing it after I left Ohio. So, uh, I mean, my favorite. I'm a city boy. I like I like the city. I like walking around in the city, and uh, uh, I like the noise of it. Um, and you know, if that, the question about you know favorite places places to write for me is a public space because. The anonymity of that is actually more satisfying to me than trying to be at home alone, in uh, you know, in a quiet room. Um, uh, but you know, that's that's sort of my experience of it. Nice, Jeff. Uh, I would have to say probably the um, well, one of my favorite places is the West End of Toronto, where I live. I live in uh, Parkdale, and um, I've lived there for the past four years. Uh, and I love it there. Um, I'm pretty uh, new to publishing and, and um, so really this area is kind of where I made the transition I think from uh, just considering doing this to actually wanting to, to do it and, and to write poetry, write and um, the area is very interesting, lots of history, um, interesting collisions to in Parkdale has a very certain um, feel to it and uh, as opposed to on Roncesvalles, it's very different. Um, one of the places I'd love to go to is um, a place called Alternative Grounds, which if, if it's a little coffee shop on Roncesvalles. Uh, but I think, just going along with what people have said thus far, I don't really write about it that much. It's hard to write about the place that you live. Um, just uh, going along with what Adam was saying, it takes, it takes some time. I think sometimes you have to move away and sort of see somewhere else to write about where you, you've been. So. Um, yeah, that's, that's my, that's my Thank answer. Thank you. Wayson, favorite places in Ontario. Right. I have favorite places in Ontario, but in my literary life, I write about Vancouver's Chinatown. And um, I'm, I think I must be the oldest one here. So my mind is going backwards. Present tense is uh, somewhere where I last placed my keys. <laughs> and I haven't found them yet. But uh, I... I am in love with Ontario and the small towns. Friends of mine invite me to their places to stay. And I have writer's retreats in cottages and in beautiful homes and in attics that uh, somebody has vacated temporarily. Uh, but my literary life is uh, lived in old Chinatown during the war years. And all my books have been placed there. The only one that was uh, related here was my book Not Yet where I wrote about my nearly having died twice and I thought I better know what I'm doing here and what it means so that became uh, a place uh, and it was St. Michael's. Thank you. 
So all I remember was the drugs were wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Maharaj. Well, I live in Ajax, and, uh, uh, <laughs> and I tend to write in a couple of the, um, the, the sort of more quiet uh, coffee shops there. And um, the reason I, I, I write there, uh, as opposed to home, is that I started doing this when my two daughters were very young. And um, since then, I've kind of always associated the house with some, a certain level of domesticity. When I go outside of my house, when I go to a coffee shop or some public place, um, just the fact that I have to concentrate, focus a little bit better to uh, remove, uh, abstract off the noise, that helps me to concentrate on uh, what I'm doing a little bit better. And like everybody else here too, it's difficult for me to write about a place when I'm living there. Um, so I need a little bit of time to look at it a little bit of distance before I can write about it. My last book was set in Toronto. I was working at a reference library at that time, right, in residence. But it took me four years before I could actually kind of imbibe all of the experiences and kind of make connections between things and actually feel confident to write about it. My most interesting place was any place where somebody comes up and says to me, I never knew Chinatown before, but I really, really got to know another world that I hadn't known before. And at that instance, I know that this is where I want to be, and I'm really glad to meet the person who said that. And that's, I think, all of us, when some reader comes up and really makes a special point of why they like our books. So never hesitate. I kind of, sorry, I kind of have a question to maybe, oh, you guys, maybe you all too, if, if you write. Like, I'm kind of, I feel like we're all on the same page about living in Ontario and not writing about Ontario for the most part. And I sort of wonder if Ontario has, like Ontario has never struck me as a place with a very distinct cultural identity. Like, you know, it's not Newfoundland and it's not Quebec and it's not, it's not even Alberta. And I kind of wonder if that, I can't think of a word that doesn't sound insulting. And I don't mean this in an insulting way, but there's a sort of blankness about the province that maybe lends itself. I mean, we have so many writers here and uh, very few that I can think of that sort of tell regional Ontario stories. Like Alice Munro obviously is one, and we have a few Toronto writers that write about Toronto, but yeah, like I just wonder if that's something that attracts you all to living in Ontario. It's like the fact that here maybe there isn't a need to tell Ontario stories because perhaps we don't have like a distinct identity to write from. I'm not picking up that <laughs> Also, if anyone disagrees with Mr. Mala, stand up. Um, I tend to agree. I think Ontario is still forming itself in a very powerful way. It has currents of art and trends at which it follows and it leads the country in publication and actually decides in, in many ways for a traditionally long time who will be published and who won't be. And I suspect that the, the age of Toronto is coming because younger writers are definitely settling themselves into this territory. And I'm reading short stories now where the place is becoming important in a way that uh, they feel they belong. Most of us, I, I mean my generation, came to Toronto to work and discovered we wanted to stay because there was good money and then it turned out to be a good life. But uh, my literary situation is where I grew up and had all the memorable conflicts and that would be in Vancouver's Chinatown. So I think that's partly the reason why, but I think Ontario is coming into its own. And certainly the small town Ontario writers are really coming up strong. I tend to agree with that. Um, in my last book I had this, um, there was a character who wanted to write a poem sort of representing the city, representing Toronto. And in 25 years, he had written two lines, simply because every time he felt he had nailed the city, it had changed in some kind of irrevocable way. And I think one of the things about Toronto, and to a large extent, um, Ontario itself, is that it's still, there are so many changes taking place that sometimes it's the, you might be right about a particular part, a particular aspect of the, of, of, of the province, of the city, 
and write about it very, very well. But that would be a small little part, a small segment. But unlike other places in New York and London, so on, we haven't really had books that are so representative of this place that people from other countries and so on say, wow, this is Toronto, this is the football Toronto. So many changes taking place um, every day, every week. It's still a place in a state of flux, I think. Well, now that Rob Ford is mayor, I mean, there are going to be hundreds of books coming out around that, too. And actually, the, the, the sense of siege actually can be very useful. Okay, well, here's something that pulls it apart um, from elsewhere. You live and write in a province with the biggest hub of publishers, publishing programs, and publishing activity in the country. Ontario's publishing has revenues and activity more than double that of Quebec, which is the second largest. And uh, if you take a look at the events page on Open Book Toronto or OpenBookOntario.com, I mean, it's crazy how many books and authors and events are always happening and coming in. So on top of that, Ontario is uniquely investing in its cultural uh, economy. Uh, agencies like OMDC are an example of that. So are there benefits to a writer to being in the hub of publishing and cultural activity? I'm going to do a quick like Marxist rant and then I'll shut up. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I like, have noticed recently, and I, it's making me more and more uncomfortable, the way the arts are talked about in terms of economy. And I was listening to CBC Radio the other day and the head of the Toronto Arts Council was on and talking about the value of the arts. And the value of the arts was only expressed in the terms of that $35 billion number I keep hearing about, it, what it, the amount of money it generates in the city. And yeah, obviously, you know, like it's important that this is our job or part of our job or part of our source of income and we make money. But I just, um, I think for me personally, like I write and the publishing industry is this thing that feels apart for me. Like my book goes into this, you know, big system that, you know, the press that I write for sort of takes care of. And I just like, for me, and I'm, I'm an idealist and kind of flaky, but I feel like what I do is, is kind of, like for me to operate as best as I can as a writer. It has to be removed from from economy, like, and finance. Like, I, I, that, <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't looking for claps. But thank you. Um, so yeah, it's just something that I've noticed in like the discourse around the arts. That's like really, you know, if we're going to defend the arts, I feel like we have to defend the arts on the arts' own terms and not just on economical. So I probably corrupted your question, but no, it I absolute agreement. But say you take from the question, which came from a reader, um, more looking at the literary activity and all the publishing activity that happens here. So not just the economy, but the support for getting the book out and connecting readers and writers and the excitement around that. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I think um, it's it's probably a, a, a double-edged sword in some ways. The benefits that accrue from living here uh, might be things that you take for granted or you don't normally think about on a daily basis, the fact that you have the publishers and all of the readings and things taking place and so on. However, in other places where you don't have that kind of um, big overarching sort of financial and other sorts of support, people tend to be more loyal, like I've done readings in other places, and I'm not in other places, where people would come out simply because they feel there's a sen sense that this is a underappreciated little town and so on, so we need to support it and so on. So over here, in, 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 over here you have the, the structure and stuff like that. And I guess we, as writers, we, we, uh, we benefit in, in particular ways, but they're so far removed from how we think, we don't normally sit down and say, okay, this is how I benefit or, or so on. I, I, to be honest, I'm not sure that I have benefited in any way. I guess in a theoretical sense I may have, but I don't know. For me, uh, I mean, the communal aspect of it, the, the fact that you, you can see people and bounce ideas off of people and read their books and meet them and, and, and have a drink with them and get into fights with them and play basketball with them, like that, that's always been a crucial for almost for 98 percent of the artists who've ever functioned out there in the world uh, um, that sort of um, encounter the encounter with other artists is crucial um, and so um, that aspect of living in Toronto in particular and 
Ontario in general, I think, is very important for me. On the other hand, you, most of us, I think, would also feel you have to get yourself away from it in order to get anything done. Um, and so there's pressure that way. But it's always easier, in, in my, from my experience, it's always easier to back away, you know, and take a month off from any of those events than if you're living in a small town to find it. Um, uh, so, uh, so for that, that's, that aspect of it is very important. I mean, the fact that there's this going on here today and we all take it pretty much for granted, and that there are people who actually are going to show up. Um, and, you know, that says something about it. So. Well, that leads in perfectly, actually, to another question that came in from a reader asking for tips or advice on uh, connecting and networking and learning, um, either programs that you benefit from here in Ontario or um, that you admire. Recommendations? Jeff? Uh, I'm, I'm uh, I guess, a product of uh, the Guelph MFA program uh, that's, that's uh, started in the last five years. I was actually part of the first cohort of that. Um, and everyone has different opinions about MFA programs, um, but as a networking opportunity, um, I, I can't think of anything that would be um, better than, than that program. There's a lot of uh, aspects of the program that are basically just networking with uh, other writers and also um, mentors, um, uh, publishers. So if you're if you're thinking of it, um, it's something to look into. It's um, uh, a, a very powerful source for for networking, definitely. I I have the benefit of being a, one of the teachers at the Humber School for Writers, and we have writers coming from all over. Uh, so I can not quite network, but make contact and see what's going on elsewhere. And sometimes, now and then, we make a friendship. You know, um, For example, somebody like David Mitchell turned out to be such a fun guy to be with that we had a great time, and now we stay in touch. So it really doesn't matter that you have a source where you meet other writers. And they can be somebody who's writing where you are writing, beginning, or they've published, and they can share their experience with you. I think it's, it's what you do as a writer in reaching out in workshops and in classes and in having people read your work that you respect. I think that's all that counts in it. That, that could happen in a small town or a city like Toronto, or it cannot happen because uh, you're too shy or you haven't taken any risks. I just saw J.M. Kitsaya read in Kingston, and the blurb at the top of his bio is, I do not believe in community, and um, he's doing pretty well. <laughs> Networking or learning? Yeah, that's full of crap, um, but <laughs> Kurtzy doesn't know anything. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you just can't be shy, that's all. I mean, you, have, you should be shy and introverted when you're working, and, and, and if you want to get your stuff out there, you have to not, you know, and it, it, uh, you have to go, you have to show up. That's, that's the easiest thing I would say. Okay, uh, some of you have touched on where you like to write. Do you want to talk about that a little more? Do you like to write at the mall, Pasha? Or just go there and clear your head. I just like to hang out at the mall. <laughs> I don't actually write there. Uh, I just like to write on my desk. I know that's so boring. Like I en envy you guys that hang out in public and do it, but um, I go in public and I generally just stare at people. And you know, yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know. I just don't get any work done outside the house. I can read outside the house, but I have to be at my desk. Um, and uh, that's really the only place I can get any work done. And I guess that desk can be here in Toronto, and I was in Dawson City, Yukon, for three months working on a book, and it was there. I had a desk there. <laughs> and, um, I've had desks in other places too, and all of those desks were great. In the home. I'm like Rob. I'm like Robin. I got I have young kids, so so getting out of the, like when you're in the house and you've got dishes to do and things things you know laundry to fold and all that kind of stuff, it's, easy, it's much easier for me to get out. Uh, and, and it does, like, you, your, your space gets smaller, which is actually useful for, for focusing for me. Uh, it, pretty much the same way that Robin said. And the caffeine helps, too. It's always a cafe. Yeah. Yeah, it's usually a coffee shop for me. Yeah, I tried the libraries, but it was actually too quiet. I like the, the, the noise, crowd noise uh, is, is nice for me, too. Excellent. 
alternative grounds? Uh, yeah, um, I going out and writing somewhere is pretty like integral for me in my process. Um, I uh, I find that sitting in sitting in my room and 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 kind of just thinking thoughts and trying to articulate them sometimes feels a little bit uh, isolated. Um, and the, 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 I think it's, the idea is to trick yourself, you know, um, and go somewhere and feel part of the, um, the public domain for a little while. Uh, so um, my process is, is pretty idiosyncratic. I don't really recommend it for anyone, uh, but uh, it, it does involve a lot of um, going to different places to write. I, I think maybe this is, um, a lot of poets say this, that uh, they like to write in places because poetry is a little bit different than fiction because you're, you're essentially um, writing um, smaller pieces, in most cases, uh, and that lends itself, I think, to that kind of, um, uh, that, that process of going out and, and trying to work on something and then bringing it back, it's, it's sort of like a, um, you know, like a larger process. How about Mason? Any Ontario, Toronto writing spots? Well, actually, I think uh, I'm one of those writers who romanticize a writer writing. So anytime in a movie they show a writer writing and then suddenly in the next scene they have a bestseller, I like that. <laughs> and then I always go, that's what I need, is a that's like Virginia Woolf had in that movie, and so on and so forth. And, um, I, I have to tell you, I, 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 I'm a late night writer. I usually start around 8 o'clock, play solitaire for a while, and then suddenly get into a mood, I hope, that I will be writing. But I have to tell you, when any of these gentlemen here talk about where they write, if I saw them writing, I actually romanticize that they're doing the next best book. And then I go to myself and I go, what am I going to do about that? The competition is tough, so wherever they write it, it works, and that's what you have to discover for yourself. Where would you like to write? And in the next scene, where would you like to sign your books? So, the question from a reader, any special insights or recommendations for a young writer looking to hone their talents? Oh, here? not actually recommending writers looking just writing they like. That actually fits well, too. Or recommending writers they should read. Um, I'll just bring up a quote uh, that I, I don't remember who said it, but I, I read it somewhere, and it was um, uh, something along the lines of genius blooms in weird places. Uh, and I think um, the idea of, of trying to um, connect, um, like, your, uh, your artistic merit to maybe a place or a series of... Um, uh, programs or something like that uh, might might not ultimately be the best way of, of thinking about it. Um, it's it's more kind of the process that you engage in, you know, on on your own in your own time reading and and um, that's probably how I, I start to address that question. Anyway, <laughs> that's great. Anyone else advice for young readers or writers? Or that's what I would say is read and then imitate, read and then steal, steal and then imitate and then read and then steal. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Okay, before I open the, uh, the floor for, for questions, um, I did want to ask one last question. It's about winning the Trillium Book Award. All of you are winners. Um, how has this achievement affected your career? I got $20,000. <laughs> so that affected the way I could pay my rent in positive ways. Um, and that to me was crazy. Like, that is, a, I know people laughing when I say this, but this, like, to me was like a crazy amount of money. Like, it felt like $20 million. And uh, I know this, it, like, it's, it sounds trite, but I mean, that was a huge part of that prize, was being, being able to get that cash and just have a little bit of a safety net for a bit. And uh, I like I you know we we got emailed these questions and this this was on there and I was like how I don't know like I didn't think about I don't think about it day to day but maybe it has like maybe like I haven't you know if I get invited to do this event obviously I'm here because I won the Trillion Book Award so that's one way it affected me and then I was like oh, okay so I got invited to other festivals and if I hadn't won the Trillion Book Award would I get to go to 
uh, like Sydney, Australia. I went to the Sydney Festival in, in the spring. So, I mean, I would imagine it doesn't hurt, you know, to have that on your resume. And uh, but for me at the time when I won it, like, I wrote this book of stories. And I was surprised that my family read it. And um, then I got nominated for a prize, and I was like, this is crazy. Like, someone else read it who I don't know. And, uh, and then I won, and I was like, wow, they're stupid too. Because like, <laughs> honestly, I, this sounds bad, but Kevin Connolly was nominated the same year as me, and that guy, and we were talking about not, uh, you know, recommending uh, writers, and I just think the poets in this province blow the rest of us out of the water like Ontario poets like there are just so many and I'm sitting beside one of one of my favorites and um, Kevin Connolly was nominated the same year as me and it's I mean no slight on the jury that picked my book and you know thanks but uh, that book of Kevin Connolly's revolver is just it's awesome so I felt a little guilty when I wanted to which is good I think a little shame is good for a writer interesting who'd like to go next Robin what when I won it, I was, uh, it, it, it happened at a time when I was becoming a little bit worried about, um, about writing, my, my own writing, and about the state of the publishing industry and so on. So it's not really good when you're writing, you have all these little sort of anxieties in the back of your mind. So that kind of put it to rest. And before this started, uh, me and Jeff were talking, and we were saying that uh, most of the money went and paying debts and so on. So as Pasha said, that was a big, uh, a big fact, that, you know, you don't have to worry about things dealing with finances. But the, I guess it, it the most, um, if I had to look back at a particular, um, at a particular moment when I felt really happy to have won it, it would have been about a week or so afterwards when, um, when I started writing and I felt much better about sitting down. Yeah, I felt there was a little bit of appreciation. For what I'm doing, and it, 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 the inspiration was a little better than it was previously. But having said all these things, I still had to discount the the money. That was a big, big, uh, you know, part of it. Thank you. Uh, my uh, second son was born a day after I won the Chilean Award, so it wasn't even the most important thing that happened to me that week. Um, <laughs> that was a good uh, week. Uh, it was a good week. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, but actually, they, there were there were similar events in that you you feel like having a kid makes you feel sort of uh, um, uh, a part of something uh, in a way that you can't escape, but which is mostly good. Um, and 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 winning the trillion was like that too, in a in a sort of weird way that that okay, I must be part of this now. I'm I'm I'm, I'm this kind of writer. I'm, I'm I've been accepted in this sort of way. I have to take myself seriously up to a point in this kind of way because other people seem to be, and so, okay, so, all right, here I am. And that sort of, um, the way one looks at oneself because of that um, acknowledge, external acknowledgement, you can't, I don't think it can be totally dismissed. And it does affect the way, I think it affected a little bit of my ambitions, you know, like I gotta maybe, you know, try a little harder. Wait, yeah, um, I have to say, I think my career is based on the fact that when I won the Trillium in 1995-96, I'm sorry, vague here, but anyways, uh, it was wonderful to win. I mean, anytime you win a prize and the publicity works for you, you'll sell a few more books. But I was lucky, I was a co-winner with Margaret Atwood, and everybody knew Margaret Atwood, and then everybody said, who's this other guy? <laughs> so I think she helped put me on the bestseller list, and uh, I hated to share the money with her, <laughs> but I love the idea that um, she was by my side when we won together. Thank you. And Jeff? Uh, yeah, I think, I think maybe just going along with what people are saying, um, maybe we like to think, if, if you're a writer, that these things don't really have that much of an impact, you know, um, prizes, recognition, stuff like that. We like to think of yourself as being sort of above that and you're going to do it no matter what and that kind of a thing. Uh, but they, but they do. Uh, there is an impact, um, and I know for me, um, it was at a time where, like, like Robin was saying, uh, that um, I was, I was wondering about it. I, I wasn't going to stop writing, um, but I was uh, thinking about doing other things, um, uh, exploring other avenues, uh, and what it helped me realize is that this is what I'm doing. This is, uh, this is the thing that I'm going to be doing, uh, and that kind of solidification. 
um, I think just from the nomination, I think uh, was was uh, was was really important for me. Yeah. Thank you. It's great to hear what the Trillium Book Award has done for all of you. Um, I know as a reader, I just love seeing the list every year because that's my reading list for those months. Um, always excellent recommendations, and it's going into its twenty fifth year this year. All right, time for questions from the floor. Does anyone have a question? I'll repeat it into the mic. Go ahead. Question for Robin uh, about your about your writing. You said that some of your writing you felt was not possible about writing about Trinidad, for example, or back home, was not possible had you not written it here as a Canadian. So I just find a, a kind of interesting comment in terms of how it is that perhaps writing in Canada opens up a lot of possibilities for various writers who are not born here. Say. Yeah, well, there are two things. Um, the first is a more practical reason. Um, if I had stayed in Trinidad, I didn't... Oh, I did you, well, you didn't hear that? Or do you want to repeat the question? You've gone next. Go yeah, you answered about um, the fact that coming to Canada sort of... Um, it gave me more access to writing and, um, and uh, the fact that I wouldn't have been able to write in Trinidad. In terms of perspective. Yes, oh, okay. So um, this kind of this this sort of related to one of the responses we gave uh, in terms of one of the questions, and that is you need to sort of um, create some separation from a particular place before you decide to write about the place. If I had made Trinidad, I wouldn't have been able to write about it because I was too closely um, aligned to the place. Some of the prejudices, the biases, the 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 that the people have there um, would have kind of seeped into my writing. I believe in a, in a larger sense that if you want to write about a place, at least in my, in my own uh, experience, you need to create some kind of separation, some sort of detachment, some sort of distance about that place. Which is why, for instance, that if I want to write about Toronto, write about an aspect of Toronto, Ontario, I wouldn't write about it as it occurred to me, but probably after I remove myself from that particular situation, after I can kind of see it a little better, uh, it's difficult to write about something when you're emotionally attached to it because then you can write in a way that's not to fear. You may even have an agenda without realizing it. Thank you. I had two books published with a, a small press and, and um, they were extremely proactive about it. They didn't have a big roster of um, authors, so they made sure that everything we wanted, we got it, and they kind of gave us this sort of very special attention. The other books were published with a bigger press, um, a bigger publishing house, and they didn't do that. They couldn't do it. What they did have, however, was a bigger reach. They were able to get the book in places or, or, or I guess, reviewed or noticed by people that the smaller press didn't couldn't simply because they didn't have the resources. I guess what I'm saying is difficult to have both. The, the, the bigger press, the bigger publishing houses, they're very mechanical in the sense that they have, they, they're forced to do things in a particular way. Um, you're not going to get that kind of individual attention. Maybe once a year, for a week or so after you publish your book, but after that, it's a kind of mill, other people come rise to the phone, and they get the attention and so on. So you have a choice, you know, whether you want to publish it, if you go to smaller houses. Each of them have their own sort of benefits and, and disadvantages. Publishers have a sort of dual role. One is, is to, to make the book better, um, and the other is to get it out in the world. So on the one hand, it's like, you know, the kind of coddling and criticizing that only a spouse can do, and then, and then, and then they have to be a sort of pimp. So, 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 like, to, and uh, so, you know, publisher. Most authors have uh, uh, criticism or praise for their publishers on one side or the other. They were their really good spouses and not the other. And uh, but, 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 but that balancing act. And I think, um, depending on where you are in your career, also maybe you feel more confident in a certain book, uh, and you just want to get it out there. And the big publishers are certainly um, um, better at getting those books out there. Um, but the editorial relationship can be crucial also. So I think it's hard, I think it's hard for the publishers to, to find that balance. 
because um, the small ones tend to have those closer relationships and understand the work better, um, but the big ones have the, the greater reach. Thanks. Anyone else want to discuss ideas? No? Thank you. We've got time for one more question. Yes, please. Yeah, I, that is, thank you. Yeah, I feel like we ignore the North all over this country. And um, it's funny, I was looking at a map yesterday of Northern Ontario, and it starts at like Barrie, <laughs> you know? And, uh, but, and it kind of ends at North Bay, you know? Like, and it's, there's so much of this province beyond that that I've never seen. And uh, it's nice to be reminded that, that it is out there and it's completely different than the rest of the province. Yeah, thanks. Well, thank you to all of you, the audience, for joining us today. And a huge thank you, round of applause for our amazing